This is He Who Moans, Doctor Who Reviews. I only complain because I like Doctor Who and I care. And I overanalyze too much because... There, whatever, it's just my opinion. Originally, back in 2010, I was 100% in favour of this point that people have against Moffat, but the problem is that overambition and overexpectation meant that it lost everything I found appealing about it in the first place. So, in 1963, when Doctor Who started, no one really expected as much of it to be made as ended up being made. And it sort of got into the tradition of this rigorous structure. For four weeks, sometimes six, seven, or in one case twelve, a story would be spread across that many episodes. Each story would be spread out in 25 minute instalments each week. The reason was that most sci-fi came in serial form back then, because no one anticipated exactly how popular a sci-fi series would get. In 1963, people didn't start the series with the expressed intention of making a franchise, as it was kind of putting way more faith into something than you could afford. Whereas now, some network can pump millions into making a 22-episode sci-fi series that doesn't take off and is considered to be a failed experiment. The sci-fi serial is put together in, say, a four-week self-contained story because we have no idea if it'll actually catch on, or if we need to make more of it, which it turned out they did. It was just based on simplicity, really. Also so they could reuse sets and actors for as long as possible. You're basically shooting four weeks of content on the same set with the same actors to fill the time slot. It just wouldn't have been cost effective to send them to a different place for 45 minutes every week. You'd be down to cardboard by the end of the series. So Doctor Who's overall series structure was based on the 1960s mindset of how sci-fi TV worked. The thing that made Doctor Who different was it hit on a good formula, and there was an endless stream of possible situations for them to tap into, and given what they were working with, scripts to fill those slots could be turned around pretty quickly by a succession of loads of different up-and-coming writers trying their stuff on TV to a guaranteed audience of millions of families with nothing better to do at the time. So that begs the question, why did the series continue in serial format for 26 years? Well, the whole idea of the sci-fi series replacing the serial was kind of Doctor Who's original idea. The show was originally something sandwiched between Grandstand and some other show for the family, and was intended to run all year round. But since it became so popular, and since it became obvious that such a punishing schedule put William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton under a lot of pressure, and barely gave them any time off, it was cut in half to save John Pertwee's sanity, until it started to run in your bog-standard 20-episode series form, like Sci-Fi Today. But they still kept with the serial format of the stories. Maybe out of tradition, and it's still being cost effective, but here's my reasoning. This thing. From a screenwriting perspective, 4 by 25 minute serials makes absolute sense for this idea. Yes, other shows like, say, Buffy can go for one week 45 minute ideas, because there's an endless amount of stuff that you can go on, but the setting is very much restricted to this one town, with only a few story-specific characters, and mostly it's villains and victims. Doctor Who, however, can go anywhere and do anything. They designed the show to be something that you could do an endless amount of stuff with, so it could be pumped out all year round. And as misguided as that idea was, the formula they hit on was pretty good at that. Episode 1, the characters are in a new setting with a new story, it establishes the characters, and the story starts to get going with its inciting incident at the end of the episode as the cliffhanger. Episode 2, the cliffhanger gets sort of resolved and adds some more explanations to the whole story, and things start to get going more, and we find out more about this new world or time period. Episode 3, the stakes are raised even further. Episode 4, grand finale and farewell to the next story. It worked well because the new setting, new characters and sometimes a new genre required a key thing that Doctor Who is famous for and probably key to why lots of new Who just flat out doesn't work. And that thing is tension. Next to the Daleks and the TARDIS, the most iconic thing about Doctor Who is the cliffhanger. Oh my god, how will the Doctor get out of this one? Was an important aspect of that experience. It keeps you on the edge of your seat, gets you thinking about the new world that they're exploring. And knowing that all of this will be done in 45 minutes, only the most skilled writers can do that well. So a lot of new Who's standalone episodes have been quick flashes of, look, the Doctor's come here to this new location and there's new characters and look, look, look there's a monster, he waves his sign screw of driver at the child at the end, bye. It just throws way too much shit at you too quickly and the resolutions end up convoluted and less about the Doctor using his intellect and more about waving the magic buzzy thing at the monster until it stops. 
because they're trying to crowbar a 90-minute plot into 45 minutes. OK, and now the backtracking. Yes, Doctor Who serialised in 2005 probably wouldn't work. While it would make Doctor Who unique in the current TV environment, what it's mostly about now is moments to get you to go, oh my god. TV's generally got more fast-paced, and Old Who, it was very slow a lot of the time, and while I enjoyed the slow pace and allowing the ideas to flesh themselves out, I do understand the requirement for shorter, snappier, self-contained stories. However, there is a problem with this. It's that one again. The single story can't exactly be that big and expansive if you only have 45 minutes to play with. Most anthology sci-fi series with, say, an hour to play with, or hell, even the Twilight Zone's half an hour, the stories are really tight and everything's there that needs to be there. Whereas in a lot of Russell's Who, they felt really constricted by trying to do a full story and the overindulgent angsty stuff in the same episode. And I really missed the story arcs and how big this idea felt. And it's clear that loads of the writers do too, because a lot of the time they throw four episodes worth of stuff into one episode creating the pacing issue. If you want to know what I'm talking about on the pacing issue, try watching back The Doctor's Daughter and asking yourself questions about everything except the fact that The Doctor now has a daughter. Yeah, you could have made this setting and characters a lot more interesting, couldn't you? Moffat's clever idea to get past the no tension thing now that we're not doing serials anymore was, okay, we're not going back to serials, instead we're going to have a more cohesive overarching arc to the series. In series 5, the crack in time in episode 1 will play a role in the events of the series and get resolved by the end of it, and all the events will be drawn together somehow. So we're having our cake and eating it too. It's sort of a serial and sort of how it was before, 10 self-contained stories. Okay, I said, great. I'm really happy you're doing that. For my complaints on why Davies' grasp of what a story arc is really doesn't work, I talk about that more in my Ninth Doctor retrospective, but this was a better idea at getting the series' long narrative down than Russell managed during his time as showrunner. And while the Big Bang was kind of confusing in parts and left a lot unanswered, it was satisfactory enough and left us hinting that he'd explain more in the future. But then I got really, really bored as I started to see the pattern emerging. Deny it all you like, but Moffat really did end up becoming the boy who cried bad wolf. Yes, I know, I am so sorry for that joke, please forgive me, but he did. Every season we had those enigmatic lines and foreshadowing, which Russell did quite a lot, yes, but not to the extent that Moffat did. I was in favour of story arcs because they would keep you guessing. What I didn't realise is that Moffat didn't have time to plan it, and was probably just making things up as he went along, rather than doing what, say, George R.R. R. Martin does with Game of Thrones actually plotting a flowchart of events, and taking the time needed to develop it. These arcs just went on not really getting that much resolution, just to be left in time of the Doctor with nothing tied together. We were going in circles. Moffat, the best thing about story arcs and mystery box plots is that it keeps you guessing, yes, but that's only one part of the equation. The second is feeling rewarded when it gets resolved. It offers a moment of catharsis. This is why the ending to Lost was so heavily slated because it didn't really tie everything together. It meandered about for six years, creating loose threads everywhere, that by the end of it, of course we were going to find it disappointing. There was nothing they could have done that would have been satisfactory to us. What you should have been doing is creating one main story thread that you resolve by the end of the series. Then this would have worked, not just posing more questions and thinking that's the conclusion, and just copying and pasting the loose ends into the um we'll do that bit later word document, and cherry picking them at random in the future, because if you do that, you'll forget where you are, and your audience will forget why they're supposed to care. That was the main problem, because our storyteller rambled on for so long going, woo, what's the mystery of the X inside the box with the question marks on it? And then he had a little sleep, and then he woke up and went, um, so yes, um, the thing inside the mystery box is a picture of a lady, and a ten-sided dice, and the word heron on a scrap bit of paper. What does this mean? Yeah, New Doctor Who really does have a problem of thinking that enigmatic equals drama, when if you fail to live up to the questions posed, then fuck does it stick out like a sore thumb. E.g., in Science and the Library, at that point, we know that Moffat is the new showrunner, and we have River Song introduced, a character from the Doctor's future. She shows up and sets up loads of mysterious stuff that'll happen during Moffat's run. Oh my god, you don't know who I am to you yet. This implies that she will be someone important and something big and epic and amazing. And then three years later, we reveal that she's the daughter of his next companion. 
Wow. Um, seriously, if that's what Moffat thinks a sci-fi revelation is, maybe this line from Time of the Doctor... So that's who blew up my TARDIS. I thought I'd left the bath running. Maybe that's a sign that in two seasons' time, the Doctor's going to de-ice his freezer or have the TARDIS windows cleaned. Maybe he's going to buy a fucking cheese grater. Wow, Moffat, I'm so amazed by what that led up to. Um, yeah, Buffy season 7, this was not. And before anyone gets on my case about this, Russell was just as bad as this. Yes, worse actually, as the convoluted drivel that he wove in the specials was definitely worse than weaving enticing build-up and then delivering a wet fart into a bin bag. But neither is more preferable on this front, because no one writing for Doctor Who seems to know what a flowchart of events is, and why it's kind of really important if you're going to spread this crap over a space of three years. I thought Moffat might have been doing that, but it's clear by the time Matt Smith left that he really was just making this up as he went along. It works in comic books, but not here. Smaller stories were easier to follow for the audience, and they were also easier for the writer to keep track of, and if you're going to prolong it for that long while your writer's barely paying attention, it shows. The splitting the series in two definitely did more harm than good, as he focused way too much on having that one big dun 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 moment, and then several months away, so you're not really on the edge of your seat anymore by the start of the next half of the series, and you're just going, yeah, whatever, could be good maybe, and he just kept on going, look, there's the point, there it is, okay Moffat, um, what's next? Um, I go have a nap and check my emails, I guess, because I've stopped caring now. Because by two months into that wait to see what happened after Riversong revealed who she was, I had totally stopped caring, and Let's Kill Hitler failed to impress me even more than if I'd just watched it as a bland, wrongly paced episode of New Who. I'd forgotten about the cliffhanger from Name of the Doctor a month after seeing it, and I wasn't following the hype by that point because a cliffhanger's resolution needs to be somewhere in sight to give you an indication that it's going to get wrapped up soon in an exciting way that makes everything add together, and you're excited to see how it ends. Leaving your audience with blue balls may sound like you've done your job in theory, but if someone's left with blue balls for three months, they're not still waiting for you to finish the job by August. They'll have forgotten that you left them with blue balls in the first place. And so will you. That's why the story arcs get so much hate. Not because they were story arcs, but because he was too focused on upping the ante than actually resolving anything. And he just forgot bits that he hadn't answered yet. So all you're really doing is going, okay, now what? Rather than going, oh, this makes sense now. Wow, what an ending. I and most people that actually like sci-fi story arcs like that feeling way more than, holy shit, dun dun dun. It's a sci-fi series, Moff, not fucking EastEnders. If you make your character say something enigmatic, then you'd better be damn sure that you've got something to follow up on that planned out ahead of time. I know the Doctor Who's made year in, year out, and often in a hurry to get everything done on time, but if you're struggling, as you would do if you're in charge of two shows and co-writing a Hollywood movie at the same time, don't overreach yourself because it cheapens any impact that a story arc might have if you just ramble about for five or six episodes not really doing much with it. Then, by the time of the reveal, it just feels cheap and predictable. Hence, four-episode story arcs were the optimum format, money-saving and not overdoing it, and it doesn't end up a rambling mess. Well, most of the time, but you see my point, yeah? Yeah. 